Mosaic Covenant followers with me, your host Dave Ulrich. This is part two of the Mosaic Covenant that I was talking about in my first video. And I hope you got something out of that first video that really helps explain a lot of what I've been sharing. Today we're going to also be uh, in this part two kind of going back over some of the stuff that I may have touched on in the first video, but a little bit better uh, scripturally where these things can be found in scripture. So um, as I was talking about, there were the feasts and so forth in the last video where I ended up at. But first I want to make one point, and this is out of uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, where it says that Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to all who believe. Now, for many years I used to, along with I'm sure many other believers out there, I used to think when it said the end of the law of righteousness to all who believe, right? The end of the law. So most will sit here and try to tell you, well, hey, that means that that law's done. The Mosaic law, end. See, Christ is it. That's the end of it. But what I wasn't understanding contextually, you know, on context, is that when it says the end, what we needed to understand is we need to put the word result behind that word. Because just to say the end doesn't quite clarify what's being said by the author, which is the Apostle Paul. Paul wasn't against and or opposing uh, that the Mosaic commandments were out of the way. He didn't say that they were out of the way. But he said that Christ is the end result of what righteousness looks like when obeying the law. That's a better way of saying that verse. But I've heard a lot of folks, and I've been guilty of that myself, take that scripture, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, out of context when he was really trying to refer that Christ set the example. He's the end result of that. And that as we obey Christ, as we follow his example, we're going to follow the example of what we're supposed to obey out of the law, out of the Mosaic law. You know, if Christ followed the commandments, if he obeyed his Father and all these things, ought we not to do the same, right? He is our Savior. He is our example. That's why when he said, again, we misunderstand what Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says when it Christ came on the scene and said, hey, look, I didn't come to do away with, or the word they use is destroy the law or the prophets. He said, I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Another word for fulfill means to complete. Now, he wanted us to understand, again, in that context, we thought, oh, complete, fulfill, do away with, right? No, that means to completely give you a demonstration of what it means to live holy before the Father. What kind of example ought we to be and ought we to follow? We have Christ as that example. Now, that's why the law tutored us until we had a living example in the flesh. Remember, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Now, in the Word, wouldn't that also contain the words of the Father, right? The Word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? We're talking about the fourth chapter, verse uh, 12 of Hebrews. Okay, so in the same sense, we have to look at the fact that Christ was the Word. He became flesh, dwelt among us. He demonstrated a perfect life. He exhibited the obedience that we're supposed to have according to the law of the Father that laid down in the Mosaic Law. So we have to tie these things together. So when we hear he's the end of the law, or we hear that he came to fulfill well, why did Christ tell us then, or tell his disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, that he is the way? He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Any man that cometh to the Father must come through me. Through him. Through what? Through his spirit, through his teaching, through his example, through his obedience. You see what I'm saying? All these things go together. So we cannot misunderstand and get sidetracked when we read these scriptures, because when you read in the very next verse, out of Matthew 5, 17, you go to verse 18, heaven and earth shall not pass away till all is fulfilled in the law. He says, not even a jot or a tittle shall pass away until all is fulfilled in the law. Hmm. I thought we were under the impression that Christ fulfilled everything. Again, I said in my last video, no, he came to fulfill the sacrificial end, the obedient end, the curse, lifting the curse off of all of those things so that we could obey, so that we could have the ministry of the Spirit of God in our hearts in obedience. That's why the law is written in our heart, because the Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit is writing those laws. 
we're still obeying him. We're still abiding him. That's what it means to abide in Christ, is to abide in his truth. Abide in the covenant. And the covenant requires obedience. Every one of these covenants require obedience. Yeah, but he's, you'd say, uh, Dave, he's already covered our, our mistakes. He's already covered our sin and all of that. That's right. But we're still required to obey. That doesn't get us away from obeying. You see, the problem is, is that we think that we're out of obedience or we don't have to worry about obedience because we're covered by the consequences of it. When the truth is, is that you can tell a tree by its fruit. Your fruit will show. If you're walking in obedience, it'll show in your life. And if you really have a relationship with the Father, it'll show in your life because you'll have the fruit of that obedience. And part of the fruit is exactly what we're talking about here. In obedience to the law, obedience to Christ. It's all the same thing. He is the Word come to flesh, dwelled among us, so that we could see what that looked like in a human, in a living example for us to follow. In any case, let's go on. Exodus, again, we'll look at the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus. I listed them real quick. It's out of 20th chapter, verse 1 through 17. You can look them up yourself. Have no gods before me, right? Make no graven images or bow to them. That's commandment two. Commandment three, do not take the Father's name in vain uh, or cast it to ruin, right? Uh, fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Fifth one is honor your father and mother so your days may go well. Sixth one is do not murder. The seventh commandment is do not commit adultery. The eighth commandment is do not steal. The ninth commandment, don't give false testimony or bear false witness, right? And the tenth commandment is not to covet anything of your neighbors, period, okay? So those are the simple ten commandments. Um, what's interesting that goes along with that Mosaic covenant is the feast that the Father laid down. I mentioned it briefly in the, old, uh, in the last video about the Old Testament. And I'm going to mention them again right now, just real quickly go over them. And you can take the scriptures down so you can look them up yourselves because it will show you that it says it's a forever statute, a forever ordinance that he laid for his people, which is something that we have to consider very seriously in our own walk when we want to comply with what the Father provided us. Just because we're Gentiles doesn't mean he didn't bring this household together so that we could learn these things of Israel, right? So here are the seven feasts that are listed. You have the Passover feast. It's listed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. You have the unleavened bread feast. It's listed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 6. You have the feast of Pentecost, or the 50 days after Passover. It's also known as the feast of weeks, Shabbat. It's listed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 through 21. Then you have the feast of trumpets. It's another Sabbath rest. All of these are Sabbath rests, by the way. Uh, it's listed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24 through 25. Then you have the Day of Atonement, or the Feast of Atonement. It's listed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27 through 32. Then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. It's listed in Leviticus 23, 34 through 35, and 42 through 43. That's also the Feast of Booths. Then you have the Feast of First Fruits. It's listed in Leviticus 23, verses 39 through 41. So there's your seven feasts. Um, those feasts, um, the Feast of Tabernacle and the Feast of First Fruits, those are actually together under one uh, timing frame. Uh, and so is the Passover and Unleavened Bread. Those go together. The rest are kind of individually situated. So they can be condensed down to practically five feasts, although there are seven total. Uh, then you have in Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 through 8, it's where Moses told the people all the words of the law, right? But the Father told them regarding the judgments, and all of Israel agreed, okay? Then Moses also took the blood of animal sacrifices, and after reading the book of the covenant to the Israelites, and they agreed, then Moses took that blood and he sprinkled it on them, right? Sprinkling of blood establishes covenant, establishes that it's a permanent covenant. That's why they took blood and sprinkled it, right? What are we sprinkled with today? The blood of Christ, okay? Through his sacrifice, we were not only sprinkled, we had our hearts cleansed by the blood, okay? So in the same way, just like that covenant was made, the covenant with Christ through the Spirit is how we enter this covenant, okay? There's no other way to enter that covenant. It's by the blood. We know today it's by the blood of the Lamb. And it's not something that we say from our mouths, just a figure of speech. Remember, if you confess with your mouth, it also says... That if you believe in your heart, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, okay? It's not just a confession of faith. 
Now, we get a lot of the churches out there, and they'll give that sinner's prayer. Just repeat after me. You know, I, Father, you know, Father, I apologize for this or that. I welcome you into my heart, so forth. Great. Congratulations, you're a member in the body. That's not how this works. Christ told us in the third chapter of John, starting at verse 5 all the way to verse 8, he says, you know, you can't enter this kingdom without being born again. You know, flesh is is one thing but being born by the spirit is a whole nother thing even nicodemus wasn't understanding he said the wind blows where it wishes <clears throat> and you do not know where it comes or where it goes same with everyone born of the spirit so this spiritual circumcision romans chapter 2 verse 28 through 29 of what paul said is something that happens by the spirit it's not something that happens by a verbal confession only so when everybody reads Oh, it's a verbal confession, and then I've received. It's more than a verbal confession. It has to do with the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And who decides the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life? Not a minister, and not you. He decides that. You can ask, remember, you can ask. But he is the one that decides to change the heart and to transform it. So remember that we do not enter this covenant of Christ by a verbal confession alone we enter this covenant of christ by a change of heart by the blood of christ by a transformation that causes us to believe in the truth okay so if anybody tells you different tell them to read the scriptures because the scriptures are very clear about that uh anyway moses sprinkled blood on them <clears throat> and standing there explaining that that was the blood of the covenant for them right then we turn to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 3, 9, 11, 16, and 29 through 34. I know that's a lot of verses, but here's an outline, just a summary of that. This was an everlasting statute. It was uh, Aaron, Moses' brother, was the high priest in the Levitical systematic duties, bringing in bulls and goats, offering for sin, and making atonement for the holy place because of the transgression of the children of Israel and their sins, cleansing the altar and tabernacle of meeting. That was the day of atonement the Father set up through Moses as a forever statute to observe, as a day of rest as well. And the high priest would do this annually. He would go into the holy place, or what we know as the Holy of Holies. Now, who went into that place once and for all? Well, let's read about that. We know who went in there once and for all out of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We'll start right there, because this explains this entire outline. So let's read it. It says right here in verse 19, Hebrews chapter 6, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Right? It says where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So, we know that Christ went in there and offered himself once and for all. He went behind the veil. And that's why the veil was torn when he was hanging on the cross. Because the way to the most holy of holies was opened up to us, even to the Gentiles. By the Spirit, though, you see what I'm saying? We cannot enter this presence of the Father without the Spirit who gives us the blood of Christ. That's why this is a spiritual thing. And this is this has to do with the outline, map, and will of the Father. It's his plan. We're so busy labeling, you know, and stamping his approval on everything that we do or everything that we decide to do about his will. It's his will, okay? He decides what he's going to do about his will. We obey it, right? That's the difference, okay? As children, that's what our responsibility is. Again, in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 through 3, Three, this is where Moses was required by the father to tell all the women in Israel who were giving birth to male children that they were commanded to have them circumcised on the eighth day after birth. And it's the same commandment that Abraham was given in the Abrahamic covenant back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. This transitioned through Christ by his spirit. We see this found in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 through 27. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And we see this in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. We've been through those before, but the circumcision that was done in the flesh is now done in the heart. 
And we can only get this heart circumcision by the Holy Spirit, okay? We can't get it any other way. So, again, we can confess with our mouth, but until we get a circumcision of the heart, a believing heart, we have not entered this covenant through the blood of Christ, which only the Holy Spirit can apply to our hearts. Now we'll go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 2, verse 9 and 15. This is a summary where Moses told the people to obey the Father's commandments and his voice so that they would have all of the blessings, right? He said, you know, if you follow the commandments of the Father, if you do these things, you will have all of these blessings. Remember what I told you? Part of the outline of the Mosaic Covenant is to uh, follow it conditionally, right? If you do this, then you get this. If you don't do this, you'll be under this, right? Or there will be a curse. Okay, so that's what Moses explains here in this section. He says that, you know, the Father wanted to set them on high above all nations for obeying his voice. Isn't it the same today, right? When we obey the voice of the Spirit, he exalts us, right? We enter a closeness and a fellowship and a communion with the Father on a greater level each time we overcome and we get closer and obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. When we're not obeying him... It's a little hard to keep getting closer in our fellowship with the Father when our ears are getting clogged, right? So we have to have a close fellowship and communion. I say this to you, the listener, and I say this to myself because each one of us works on this every day, okay? It's not a, it's not an overnight success here. It's a, a daily walk, okay? Um, so they had to walk in his ways and the rest of the nations would see that they belong to the Father and they would fear because they would see the greatness of the Creator and all His glory as His children represented Him even in their obedience to their relationship with Him. But if they didn't, you know, the curses would be upon them. So they had to be very careful uh, in their obedience of this Mosaic Law. And that's what's so awesome about Christ because He lifted that curse, right? And we're going to get to that in a minute here. But let me read this last thing. It's out of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. And then we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 31 through 6, okay? But this is where Deuteronomy 29 says, Moses tells the children that the secret things belong to the Father. However, things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Now let me ask you something. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it was declared there that this law was going to be forever. Now, did Christ come and validate that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18? You bet he did. He said that heaven and earth would by no means pass away until, and not even one jot or one tittle, right? Until all this law be fulfilled. Okay, that's a long time, you know, and so forth. And that is upheld in Christ. Moses declared it was a forever law. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what part of this do we scoot aside because it doesn't apply today, okay? Or do we really get honest with the covenant that we're reading? We really get honest with the truth that is laid out from the old to the new and understand what's actually become obsolete and what's actually there permanently, okay? Because if you start chopping this up and excluding things, well, you better take heed to the warning that Christ gave out of the fifth chapter of Matthew, verse 19 through 20, he said, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the Pharisees, and you start teaching others to do these, not to do these commandments, he says, you're not going to be blessed. You won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, well, a lot of people read it. It says, well, it says it will be least in there. You know what least means in, in the perspective from the Hebrew? Least actually means to be outside, excluded. Okay, That means you won't be in the presence of the Father. You'll be in eternal darkness. Because all of the domain of the entire creation, whether it be hell, Hades, and heaven, all are under the domain and the kingdom of the Father. So, by you be considering least, that means you're in the farthest regions. And what does it say in a lot of the parables that Christ used? He said, you will be cast out into outer darkness, gnashing of teeth, the servant that disobeyed his master's orders. Okay, so it's very clear in there. Let's not try to scoot the truth away. We want to embrace it for what it says. Okay. Verse chapter 30, verses 1 through 6, uh, speaks on Israel's captivity. And when you get to verse 19 and 20, Moses calls heaven and earth as witness, right? What did Christ call together? Neither heaven nor earth shall pass until 
nor one jot or tittle, right, of the law, till all is fulfilled, until heaven and earth pass, right? Moses called heaven and earth as a witness, and so did Christ. Isn't that interesting? That he set before the Father's people to choose life by obeying the Father's voice and his commandments, or to choose death and be cursed in the land, okay? And we see a lot of that today. We wonder why we see murders all the time, why we see these school shootings, why we see all kinds of crazy things going on, because we're still dealing with the Abrahamic curse, right? We're still dealing with the Mosaic curse. Those who are blessing Abraham's offspring, and that's not exactly going on these days. Uh, those of us walking in faith, we see, you know, we get persecuted for our beliefs and all that stuff. And we see uh, many of the shootings and the killings and all of these things going on in the news, the murders and rapes and everything else. The curse is still there because of disobedience, okay? But the person who walks in obedience to the Father has his protective hand around them. And that's what we need to know because in Christ we have that. And that's why we want to make sure we understand these covenants correctly. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go into, real quickly, we're going to look at what Christ had to say about the Mosaic Covenant. Real quickly, uh, we see, of course, I've mentioned this several times, and I'm going to mention it again. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. He said it himself. So, did he validate the law? Yes, he did. Did he say it was important? Yes, he did. Because when you get to verse 18, he says, you know, heaven and earth shall by no means pass away until all is fulfilled in this law. Okay? He also said, uh, and that includes uh, in Revelations. If you include in Revelations chapter 12, verse 17, let's look at that for a minute, you know, because a lot of us read past this and we're like, oh, yeah, that's great. We hold to that. Well, do you really? Because what does it say in Scripture? It says the dragon, and we're talking about the devil. In chapter 12, verse 17 of Revelations, and the dragon, we know that's the devil, right, was enraged with the woman. The woman is symbolic of Israel, okay? And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God. Now, what's interesting is it says who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. Who do you think, who do you think uh, the scriptures are referring to? Well, we have the testimony of Christ. We have the grace. We have the Father's favor. Yeah, but are you obeying the commandments? See, that's all part of it. Christ didn't speak against those things. And that's part of the testimony of Christ, is not only having his grace, but having obedience to his commandments. They all go together. Even Christ said this over and over. If you obey, if you love me, you obey my commandments, right? Um, we That'll be a whole other section there, but it's listed all through the Gospel of John, and it's listed in 1 John. Uh, this is just an on and ongoing um, teaching. Uh it says in chapter 5, verse 20, you know, Christ told us that our righteousness has to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees who talked the law but didn't live it, okay? And what's interesting is that uh, after Christ quoted the two greatest commandments after out of Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 through 40, um, he also told his disciples in the 23rd chapter, and I'm going to read this to you. This is what he had to say about the teaching of Moses and about the Pharisees and the scribes, which kind of caught my attention um, because he did chastise the scribes and the Pharisees and he came against their traditions and their religious attitude and their disobedience to the truth about God's law. But he did tell his disciples this because he didn't speak against the teaching of Moses. And that's what we have to see in these scriptures is that that's not done away with. <laughs> Uh, when it comes down to following the obedience of the commandments itself. In the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 3, we'll read this out of Matthew. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Now, the word sit in the seat of Moses is a figurative way of saying they teach from what Moses taught. In other words, they now take the place of what Moses was doing. They're sitting there teaching from his chair, so to speak, okay? So that's a figurative way of putting that. They sit in the seat of Moses. So what does Christ say from there? He goes, therefore, in other words, since they do that, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, 
for they say and do not do. Okay? Now, commandments, the teachings of Moses, things I've already gone over with you about the feasts, the seven feasts, the commandments of the Father, that's all the teaching of Moses. Well, the only thing I've left out and the only thing that I've corrected, I haven't really left it out, I just said that it's unnecessary, is the Levitical system, the sacrificial things, the ceremonial washings and all of that. And you know, that's interesting because all of that fits well with what Colossians tells us in the second chapter. Colossians tells us in the second chapter uh, these words which help identify what Christ took care of. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, says having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to a cross okay again the regulations of the levitical system was removed out of the way so we don't have a hindrance and then when we read in third chapter verse 13 of galatians we see that he lifted the curse as well so we don't have Levitical regulations. We have none of those things to deal with in the tent of tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And we also don't have the curse to deal with. So what's left? Obedience to the commandments. See, that's, that's where we have to get back to this. Now, the church wants you to run away from this truth. They want you to go, oh, no, no, no. Nobody's justified by doing the law. You're right. And Paul's argument in the entire third chapter of Galatians is all about circumcision of the flesh read it study it because i could talk till i'm blue in the face and that doesn't mean anything to you the listener unless you actually sit down and read the third chapter and find out in the very beginning and i'm going to read it to you just to make sure you understand what paul's argument was with the law because there were a lot of folks coming in and telling the gentiles they had to get snipped they had to get circumcised in order to follow the rest of the Mosaic teaching, and that wasn't true at all. And that's what Paul's argument was. That's why he says, starting in verse 1 through 3 in Galatians, chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And you keep reading along, and he gets over uh, to verse um, 6 in that same chapter. Just as Abraham believed, and God, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, right? And so it goes on to say, uh, verse 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now what he was talking about is circumcision, right? Uh, let's see here. Because the whole point is that they were being convinced that they needed to be circumcised. And that's what this argument was all about. Um, right here. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. This is verse 21. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Okay. So... And because we see that they're talking about the Abrahamic covenant here, uh, which the Apostle Paul is explaining, he's showing here that it has to do with what they were required in the Abrahamic covenant, which was the circumcision of the flesh as a sign in the covenant. And we've already read that, and you've heard that in my video. If you haven't, uh, go watch the video of the Abrahamic covenant that I laid down earlier. And that shows that part of the promise of that covenant was that they were circumcised in the flesh in order to have a sign of identification with the father to be a part of the promises that the father had for Abraham and his entire household so basically understanding that covenant that was Paul's argument in the third chapter that's why he says oh foolish Galatians who's bewitched you why do you think you have to continue in the flesh again? You have to continue to follow this law by the flesh. You have to identify yourself as part of Abraham's offspring 
by circumcising your flesh. That's following the law again. And he says, you're not going to be justified in Christ that way. And that's what he was saying. You're falling from grace. You're falling from the favor. The favor comes, the circumcision happens of the heart, and we obey by the Spirit, not by the letter of the law in physical circumcision. So again, you got to understand what the argument was there. And the same argument was also identified in the 15th chapter of Acts, starting in the very first couple of verses, 1 through 3, you start hearing about the issue of circumcision, and that's why the Apostle Paul and Barnabas went to the brethren in Jerusalem alongside Peter and James, who argued the issue of, hey, these Gentiles don't need that circumcision. They're under the grace. So we have to distinguish what the arguments were about, understand what the setting is, why these arguments came about between the Gentiles and the Jews, so that we could appropriately apply scripture to ourselves today by the spirit instead of getting distracted from the truth right um so we see what christ had to say about these things we see that he came not to destroy the law but he came to destroy the hostility that the law brought okay let's read that out of ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 through 16 because that really teaches us um what he actually came to deal with chapter 2 verse 14 through 16 says for he himself is our peace who had made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity now there's the key word okay the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace he brought both households together right You've got the house of israel and the house of judah okay or the house of Jacob and the house of Judah. He, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death, what? The commandments? No, putting to death the enmity. Okay, so it was the hostility that was there. The fact that we couldn't comply with that law, those regulations, okay? So that's what we have to understand. That's what he removed. It's very specific in scripture what he removed. You get to Colossians. We already read in those scriptures where he specifically, in Colossians 2.14, removed the regulations and the debt of certificate and those things that were against us. He nailed them to a cross. So that's why we have to understand, rightly dividing this word, rightly understanding the counsel of the covenants in their entirety, so that we don't throw away, as I said earlier, the baby with the bathwater, and end up disobeying a covenant that we're supposed to be following, right? Okay, um, so even in James, right, faith without works is dead, okay? You can show me faith and I can, uh, without works, and I'll show you faith by my works, right? He, he argued about the concept of faith without works. In other words, I don't have to work for my salvation. It's already been achieved for me. That's the grace. That's the rest I have in Christ. However, I still have a responsibility to bear the fruit that he gives me, right, through the Spirit that I'm supposed to become fruitful in the truth that he's given me, and thereby you will see the fruit of my faith by what I do in my life, by the works that I do. And that's to be shown in every child's life, is that they show the fruitful results of the work of the Spirit, which are the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. Against such things there is no law. Okay? Now, that's coming out of the fifth chapter of Galatians, verse 22 through 24. When we understand these things, we understand that it is our responsibility to continue in our obedience, our faith, so that we can do the works of our Father, which is to bear this fruit in our lives and in the lives of other people. I hope you get a better understanding of what Christ had to say about the Mosaic Covenant, of, of what the Old Testament is about, is about versus what the New Testament is about. And so um, I'm trying to lay out the whole counsel of the Father. Um, in my next video, I'm going to be um, zeroing in on a specific issue. One of those issues is going to be specifically on the Sabbath rest. Um, I think there's so much confusion going on in the church these days about that Sabbath rest. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do with what we got handed down through tradition rather than what the scripture actually says. So I'll be sharing an outline and an overview of that in my next video. So stay with me. I hope you've been encouraged.
My name is Minister Dave Ulrich, and I pray you be blessed today in hearing all of this and share this with those who need to hear it. Be encouraged. This is Community Covenant followers. Be blessed.